Good evening. It's a brand new year and with it comes the opportunity to inspire and empower. At On Point, we bring you exciting, creative, innovative women, ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. We hope their stories will give you hope and help us all make this world better than when we found it. Our guest tonight is Selena Kuruleva, known for many years as Naylina. She is widely recognized as the expert voice on mental health, an issue so many of us are aware of, but not many of us know enough about. Selena, welcome to On Point. Good it's night, so good to see you in that beautiful, bright red dress. So how have you been? Good, Ellen. Thank you. And thank you for having me here uh, this afternoon. Oh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. It's a very important um, industry that you work in mm -hmm. and your job is extremely required you know, in, in this country and anywhere else in what you do. Tell me, where did it all start? You know, where, where are you originally from? Okay, uh, my, I'm from Lomaiviti, Namadu Koro Lomaiviti, Vasu in Bureta, Ovalau, Susu Mai Lasakao Mai Mbau. Went uh, to primary school in Vilta Primary School, the youngest of four siblings. Right. Um, after Vilta School, went to Silver Grammar School. Um, so yeah, um, I think a lot of us uh, know those two schools very well. Absolutely. And then I uh, did my first degree at USP before I taught for a couple of years and then um, went on to do my uh, master's in counseling and psychology in Santa Clara University in California. Right. So you went into USP and what was your actual degree in USP? I wasn't aware that they were offering... Oh no, they didn't. My, my first degree was um, uh, management and history politics. Right. Um, and then from and when I went to uh, teach, my first job was teaching. I taught English, geography, and history. Um, and you asked what inspired me to change uh, change careers. Yes. Uh, when I was teaching, I was uh, two or three years older than my high school students. Right. Yes. What school were you teaching? Um, in? I taught at Andy Dakumbo School. Right. At uh, Coral Island High School and at Murray's Brothers High School. Right. Um, and a lot of times, I guess because our age was so close, a lot of these young people came to me asking for help. Um, because but the point issues. there is that you were, that you must have gone to university when you were 12 then. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, 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 no. We're just one of those people who went hard out when yes, we went to yes. school. So, yeah. Um, did that. And a lot of young people used to come to me and ask for help, you know, because there was problems at home, um, girlfriend issues, boyfriend issues. So... The more I talked to them, I was getting worried that maybe I was doing more damage than good. Maybe I need to go and get another education. Um, and of course, I have a lot of relatives, as we all do. And a lot of people used to come and think, you know, oh, because you have a degree, you must be really smart to so help us out here. So that uh, was one of the turning points for me. And of course, my late mother, God bless her, um, was, a, was a nurse, uh, a midwife, a senior sister at that. So she used to, you know, like helping people. And uh, my father was, uh, was a manager at MHs. So there was always a lot of people around, a lot of people to help. And yeah, just all of that. And I guess growing up in that sort of environment um, really pushed us to, to do better, to be better mm. um, and help people. I guess because I was very young at the time, it seemed like it was easy to change courses, and right. so I did, and I've never turned back since. Right. So what you're saying is you went to teach English and, uh, and, and history, and, and then all of a sudden the students were coming up to mm -hmm. you and asking, but what was it about you that, asked the, that made the students re feel that they could get some attention from you? Because you know, I've known you for many years. You're a very good friend of my daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, we've worked together on the Suva Grammar School uh, committees, mm -hmm. and I've seen the kind of person you are and you seem to be quite approachable. Why yeah. was it you and not anybody else? Um, I guess just um, showing people that, you know, we all have a hard time uh, every now and then, and it's okay. Hmm. Um, being approachable, uh, building that trust, being able to hold information if people tell you things, that you keep it safe. Yes. Um, Suva is very small. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think a lot of people trusted me uh, maybe because they could come and talk to me and they, they would, would not be judged. Um, I often tell people that, you know, it's very easy for us to, when someone tells us things, that we go and make up our own minds. Or st but, you know, that's their story. That's their narrative. Mm. It's extremely important that we allow people to tell their narrative. 
Um, there's only one person who's allowed to judge us, and he's up there, not us. Um, so I think I, I, I did a lot of that, and that's why people found me more approachable. I also uh, talk a lot. Uh, that's <laughs> so, not, not <laughs> true, really. <laughs> so when people, um, I guess, feel comfortable when they can say things and, you know, don't feel judged, it's okay. She'll say, she'll speak her mind, and then we just get on with it. Right. It's also important not to hold grudges. Um, and I think I'm, I'm very big on that. Mm. I hope I, I, I am I'm big on that. But keeping information safe. When someone gives you some information, it's extremely important that you keep it safe because this is their story. It's not mm. yours to tell. So from there on, you went on to, from, you left USP and you taught for a couple of years and then you decided to do a degree in psychology. Yes. And where did you do that? I did my degree in Santa Clara University in California. Right. Um, yeah, it was a four-year degree that I completed in two years. Fantastic. Um, I did some work uh, with after-school programs. Uh, dealing in America? With, in America. Um, I worked in Oakland and in uh, San Francisco and in Santa Clara. What was Clara. the age group that you were working with um, there? Uh, young people in high school, middle school and high school between the ages of 13 to 17. And they obviously hired you because you had a degree in psychology. Yes, yes. So there was a need in that school. There was a need, but you know, I often tell myself um, because we have such completely different cultures here in, uh, and uh, in America. Um, I would tell myself because, you know, we'd have to go through the metal detectors and do all of that. And it was like, oh, no, give me the worst day in any Fiji school, any time. Um, right. And I thought I uh, would be better utilized here. So even though it was good there, there was recognition, um, it just felt like something was missing. I thought I would be more useful coming back home. And, and you didn't feel that, you, you don't, so there wasn't actually a need for you in Fiji, is that what you're saying? I felt that there was a greater need in Fiji than there was, is in America. Oh, absolutely. So, and, sorry. Yeah. And of course in America there are a lot more mental health professionals. Um, what were the problems in America that might have been similar to the problems that, we, that you encountered in Fiji? Um, the use of drugs, obviously the scale and the intensity was quite different. Um, bullying, there's bullying. What year are you talking about? I'm talking about uh, 2000, 2001, 2001 to 2003. Right, Yeah. right. Um, and of course it was um, after the, um, the, the bombing of the World Trade Center. Right. So we were there for all that, all the trauma that came out of it. Um, one of the planes that went into the Twin Towers um, two students that went to my university um, died on that airplane. Right. So there was a lot of that and, you know, just learning to regroup and am I, am I right fit that here? That must have been a very traumatic time. Yeah. I mean, it was a pro very traumatic time. Yeah. And to have to deal with children who had been exactly exposed. Yeah. Yeah. So that was difficult. And then I was thinking, you know, we're watching it here and we're getting uh, vicarious trauma. What about the people back home? Because this is also on the back of the 2000 uh, political upheaval. Yes. Um, so I thought, yeah, you know, maybe uh, it is happening back home. I'm sure it's happening back home. So uh, perhaps I could put myself to better use by being back home. So were you actually intending and staying in America? Um, yeah, no, um, not really. I wanted to come back home. I don't. At that time, I did I mean, not. Your intention think. was to go to America, become educated, and come and help. Yes. The, the you know create yeah um, a solution here. My intention was to come back and be better equipped to get an education, be better educated, better skilled, uh, be more competent, and come back and help the young people more. That was my goal. When I went over there, I uh, I thought I was going to continue education, but uh, lo and behold, all my core units were were in psychology. Um, because obviously you can't really teach people unless you know how, mm. how people are made and, they, and understand the relationships between people and what they're thinking. Um, so I did that and I thought, right, there's my paper now. This is what I'm going to do. That's why I, I changed to psychology. Mm. And so when you came back to Fiji, what year was that? I returned to Fiji in um, April 2003 and taught at the university for three years. Right. So you returned... And you obviously um, were looking for work. Yes. Did it hit you in the face, the, the amount of work that was here? Ah, well, this is where it gets interesting, and I hope uh, people are listening. 
because um, when I got back to Fiji, I wrote uh, 54 applications. So I just opened the phone directory. Um, HR manager, you know, wrote uh, ANZ Bank, HR, um, Fiji prisons, just everybody and anybody. Out of the 53, and including various government ministries uh, and the university, out of the 54 applications, four of them responded a year later. N the others did not respond, and they all asked me if I could come and work for free. So I said, no, I'll just uh, join the university. Um, joining the university was, was good. You went back to USP to work? To work, to right. lecture yes, at I the remember university. That period. Yes, yes. So Look, let's hold it right there because that's very interesting. It's, it's something else I want to discuss with you. This, this absolute um, trend here in Fiji where people just don't respond to uh, emails mm -hmm. or phone calls mm -hmm. or anything. We need to break, take a break now, but when we come back, Selena talks about the ever-increasing rates of suicide. So don't go away. Welcome back. You are watching On Point and we are talking to Selena Kuruleva, a psychotherapist who works in suicide prevention. You mentioned you got back from the States, Selena. You came out here, you put out 54 applications mm. and you didn't get one single response. You had two degrees and you had the skill now uh, to be able and experience of working in America mm. to be able to help a problem that had been growing steadily mm. in Fiji. First of all, you got no response whatsoever from any of these people. And mm. when you did, they asked you to work for free. Yeah, one year later, mind you. A year later. <laughs> yeah. That so is absolutely shocking. Uh, shocking. Um, I mean, it's bad disheartening. And yeah. For you, it's disheartening yeah. that you've done all this work. But, uh, you know, etiquette wise and, and uh, talking about good manners, mm. you know, why is it people can't just say yes or no? no? And because inside, I suspect you're a psychologist, you know this they're probably sweating because they haven't said yes or no. And it's something they carry on their shoulders. Mm. And one thing I've always said to people is, and my team is, if you can't do it, say so. If you can do it, say yes yeah. and then do it. Because the pressure off you is just absolutely amazing. And, and that's, uh, that's on point, Alan, because there, there seems to be a need uh, f for people. And, you know, in those early years, it seemed like people were, I, I don't want to say rude, but it's just, um, yeah, inability to just speak up mm. and just, okay, you know, I'm sorry, but we can't employ you. or And that's fine. It just Absolutely allows the person correct. to go and do something else. That's right. And um, allows them to move on. Yeah. Because otherwise, this no pile is sitting there as a reminder every day. I've got to deal with that no <laughs> pile. I've got to deal with that no pile. But I'm in fear of saying no. Yeah. And then, of course, because you haven't actioned it and people get all worked up. And that's here right. goes the stress. Exactly. And then the stress builds up. And then, you know, if you just so happy to know that person that you wrote that letter to, then you two start having this thing yes. going. So, yeah, a whole host of things Is that a mental happen. disability? <laughs> Can we put that in mental disabilities? Yes. Okay, look, um, you came back, you didn't get those jobs that you re applied for. What, what kind of jobs were you applying for? Uh, I was looking at organizational psychology right. at the time. What is organizational psychology? Um, looking at how uh, people relate in an organization how best to help people in an organization, looking at the team dynamics, uh, doing the assessments, who is the best fit where. Right. Um, so that was one part I was looking at. And the second part was um, helping young people. Mm. Uh, how can I help young people? Maybe in the schools, maybe in, uh, at the university. So when I say helping young people, it was helping young people to get started, be motivated, be different, uh, do something. Um, everyone has a story and, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that, appreciate mm. it, and then let's get on with it. I think too so many times we're looking at only the bad part of people. Or the yes, bad and without yeah. trying to develop the good qualities, yeah, exactly. which eventually will override the bad qualities. Absolutely. And the bad qualities, I suspect, are there because the good qualities are not being worked, worked on. on. Exactly. Um, you then moved on to, you came into the National Suicide Prevention Work. Yeah. So what actually was the first job that you got that you thought was you were yeah. uh, entitled to because of your experience? Um, I, f I lectured at the university for three years at USP in, in the Department of Psychology. And while I was lecturing there, then word got around. Then I um, started doing some work for the UN agencies. And of course, uh, through the Ministry of Health, the National Committee on the Prevention of Suicide. Um, 
And when we went to do that work, and I felt, right, you know, lecturing is great. It's a sure dollar at the end of a couple of weeks because you get a regular pay. Uh, but going this way in terms of suicide work, going out into the community, doing communi community advocacy, uh, really opened my eyes to what was happening on the ground. And then I thought, right, this is what I came back to and do. And what was happening on the ground? Oh, my goodness. Um, families breaking apart, young people unable to talk to each other, lots of disrespect. Um, you know, when I left Fiji, there was a lot of... Uh, when the teacher said something, you, um, you, you listened. listened. Uh, whether they were right or wrong, you listened. Uh, when you were uh, asked if there were any questions, then you'd raise your hand and say something. But what I came back to was, you know, the teacher is talking and people are talking back. So there was a huge dis degree of disrespect. So one of the jobs that I took on um, was, you know, we need to go back and teach our communities parenting skills. We need to teach basic manners, and it starts in our mm -hmm. first classroom. Respect? Yeah. Respect, you know, um, honesty, compassion. And it starts in our first classroom with the first teachers, and that's at home. So a lot of the early years, I was doing that, uh, that sort of work. And of course, because now we were working in the community, people were able to come to us and identify what were the factors in the community that was adding to the stress, uh, factors in the community that prevented young people from talking. Um, so just looking at how we, you could break down those barriers, but also doing it in a very culturally appropriate way yes. instead of being, you know. Because you actually go out to quite a lot of the communities. Yes. And in that capacity, by this stage, you mm. had actually opened up your own consultancy. Yes, I had uh, opened up full-time private practice. Why did you find the need to do that other than working with other organizations? Um, I was the only one who had this degree, and I think for some organizations who had already uh, established themselves, um, maybe I was viewed as a threat right. uh, because, because of my academic background, but, um, and there wasn't always a gel, and that's okay. Yes. Um, so I thought it was best for me at the time um, to start my own and go slowly. Um, like I said, eh, you know, in the beginning, no one wanted to hire me, you know, just come and talk for free, etc. The first, uh, uh, first three years in Fiji, apart from the full-time job at USP, I would see clients maybe two, three times, three days a week. From about 2007 onwards, I saw clients every day, Monday to Monday. And this is a one-on-one, -on -one, because yes. I do remember you were the only psychologist yes. in this yes. town, and that was very surprising, yes. considering the growing need mm. amongst the youth of Fiji. Mm. What, in effect, happened that created this growth? Because, you know, we're all known, Fijians are traditionally known and culturally known as really happy people. Mm. The tourists come here to see our big smiles mm. and and mm. you know this very relaxed attitude mm. but underlying underneath under all of that is this horrible situation mm. and th that needs attention but yeah. but nobody in this country w yeah. were able to yeah. address it you know and i think for me why a lot of people came to me because apart from being the only one at the time trained uh was keeping information safe you know my brothers would go would say to me hey we saw so-and-so come to your office. Did that person really come? What was the mm. issue? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. You know, mm. And they would, people would try and get information out of me. Mm. And that is from the tangent here and there because you don't talk about these things. Right. So for but me... you're not talking about it. That's fine. What, how does um, the, the clients that you're seeing, are they talking about their problems to somebody else? And if they're not, is that why they come to you? Yes. Um, traditionally, and we've written a couple of uh, papers on this and published it, is that we go to our first stop is the person we feel most comfortable with. Right, right. And we don't go to that person anymore. It's because there's a friction that has occurred. Yes. We don't trust them. Maybe they're the perpetrator. Yeah. Maybe they're the ones causing you to stress yeah. out. So we look for other avenues. When, we, when people look for other avenues in this country, what we've found, we go to uh, spirituality. Right. Um, so a lot of our church leaders have been doing a lot of good work, but then there are also some of us who are not doing any good work. And, you know, we're just trying to... Uh, um, uh, without any disrespect intended, trying to um, evangelize. Maybe at that time, that's not what they need. So it well, was and, coming and, to and a and neutral... Well, this is a, 
this is the the mind. Yes. You know, and you need your experience yeah. and skills. You need to be trained to mm. be able to address that because wrong information and wrong analysis mm. could be more damaging. Yeah. What what makes those people decide to come to you? Because you know, the Fijian nature is not, not to come to come yeah. and seek professional counseling. It's almost like a sign <laughs> of weakness. And sorry, it's not just a Fijian. It's global. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But uh, more, more interesting is Fijian people getting up and saying, I've got to go and see Selena. People have, uh, the people who came to see me in the early years, most of them were uh, expatriates. All right. And I guess the word got around in the expatriate community. Then they went to, uh, to the locals. So we're talking about um, senior, senior people um, in business, in government. Um, so I guess then they started speaking to their people. And I've always um, maintained a very high level of confidentiality. And I think when people come and say, oh, what about so-and-so trying to come and badmouth so-and-so? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. So I guess also having that really, nah, these are the boundaries and right. sticking to the boundaries uh, makes people safe. People come and seek help because they've tried every other traditional avenue that they've tried in the past and it hasn't worked. Mm. They want a new song, a new strategy, mm. and that's what we're about. Right. Because some of the stresses we have today, some of the hardships we go through and the challenges, this is not what we were taught no. or what our parents taught is us. Is it hard on you? Um, you're treating all these people and they're listening mm. to these various problems <laughs> every single day. And you say you're seeing seven people a day, you know, uh, you go home. What, I go home and I go to sleep. What happens to <laughs> Selena Kura Leather when she gets home? I go home and I sleep for and a couple of hours. you need to go see a psychologist. Yes, exactly. So I still stay in touch uh, with, my, with my mentors overseas, with my, right. my counsellors, with my uh, professors. Um, we do case management here with uh, key professionals here in the medical field when there is a difficult case. Um, I uh, have really good ex grammar fr uh, friends and uh, support system. I have good friends and my cousins, my tavales, you know. Okay, Seth, I think you need to uh, de stress. Uh, yes, because you would need a support yeah. system to absolutely do yeah. that, de stress. I would like to come back and talk. I'd like to talk more about um, some of the youth and the actual mm -hmm. problems that exist in the, in, what you're, um, in the work that you do. So when we come back from the break, we'll talk to Selena about what we can do as a community. And first of all, what the actual issues are that she needs to address to try and help our young people and those who might need mental health support. So stay with us. <laughs> Selena Kuruleva helps many people deal with the stress of life. Some of them are people who have tried to take their own lives. Have a mm. listen. Selena, the issue in Fiji is dire, isn't mm. it? And we don't have a large population. Mm. We can't continue losing mm. mainly young people through suicide. Mm. What are the statistics? Uh, statistics currently in Fiji, um, largest uh, group of completed and attempted suicides are people between the ages of 15 to 29. Oh. This is consistent with global trends, uh, largest um, gender-wise, more males than females. And this, again, is consistent with global trends. Um, just looking at that figure, 15 to 29, and the age has gotten younger, by the way, so that's really? a real concern. Um, these are people who are supposed to be completing high school, starting university, starting a job, uh, traveling, uh, starting a family. But instead, that people see this as an option is really dangerous, it's sad, um, and it's of a huge concern to, uh, to everybody who works in this area, eh? to everybody, basically, to communities. And what we've uh, seen, um, anecdotal evidence, because there has been uh, some research, not a lot, uh, done in the area of uh, suicide prevention, suicide awareness for Fiji, relationship problems is right there. I've one. seen a lot of that. I mean. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, relationship problems within the immediate uh, nuclear family as well as relationship problems with the uh, in-laws um, and also relationship problems with people starting a relationship. So that's number one. Number two is economic difficulty. Uh, we're struggling, man. The cost of living is really high. Uh, people are finding hard to feed their families, feed their children, get on the bus. And, you know, when, you have, when you're trying to survive on $80 a week or $100 a week, you can't. Just at that point, I never, I've never been able to understand that. 
okay, so I can't support my family. I've only got 90, only earning $100 a week and, and the economy is slow. Everything's too expensive. So now, because I can't deal with it, I'm just going to kill myself. Do they not understand that by doing that, they've left a more, a bigger problem behind other than the one that they can't deal with? Because mm. then you have a whole family who's lost the breadwinner and lost the ability to be able to go mm. to school and and your whole life mm. is destroyed. Yeah, and you know... What we, makes them go to that point? We, we th when we talk about suicide, we talk about it like a, um, like a black dog. It just mm. envelops you and it continues to eat away at you. And because you think you're different from someone else, you stop reaching out to people. Um, so yeah, I only earn $100 a week, but I go around putting on this facade that everything's all right. And, and you know what? Eventually it will get to me. So I, I, I think people, no, not I think, people need to remember, people need to learn that not everybody will have 500 bucks a week, and that's fine. But you need to think of ways of helping not only yourself, but your children or the family that you leave mm. behind. Because the devastation, as you rightly pointed out, Alan, is far greater than in, that, than in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the person who has started going down this road, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our suicides, and again, this is consistent with global trends, is associated with depression. So, so people... So it's, uh, you already have a pre, what do you call it? Pre, a a pre-existing pre condition. condition. Yeah. M most of the cases are like that. Um, that's not to say that every depressed person will go and attempt or complete a suicide, mm. but there is a very close relationship between... Right people who are depressed right. and people who then uh, decide. Right. And going back to the child, so that 15 to 29 year old, mm. you know, as we said, it's a year, it's a time of your development, your yes. career, so after school career, university career. Um, how do you find these people? How can you help them? Whose job is it to try and identify? Is there a method to identify people who you think are going to commit suicide? There is a method. Uh, we do a lot of training on uh, and community awareness on signs and symptoms. What are you? What are we looking for uh, within the families? We're looking. Uh, we're asking parents to be more vigilant. We're asking uh, grandparents, caregivers, notice the changes when your child, who's usually outgoing, just comes and starts locking themselves away in the room. You need to be worried. Uh, when the child who loves rugby, who loves netball, just stops playing, gives away their things, you need to be worried. Um, some of us, uh, some people I've heard comment like, oh, the more we talk about it, the worse it gets, because then you're planting the idea. That's a myth. You never plant the idea. For someone to decide to go down that road, they've been contemplating, usually they've been contemplating this for a while. Really? And then... People reach out in different ways. Some of us shut down, completely hide in our rooms, and we hope that someone will say, come on, come mm. out of there, Ellen, what's going mm. on? You're not usually like mm. this. But again, Fijian culture, sometimes you want to do the tambu thing and kundu shishu, let him rest. And right. No, we need to reach out. As soon as we see a, ch a change in behavior, we need to reach out. This is one of the biggest indicators that something is wrong. And what's that kind of, is that training being given to parents at school? Or is it a school project, uh, you know, the, the home and parents' home? Yeah. Is, the PTA, the yeah. PTA? We, we do community awareness. it's got to start at yeah. school, hasn't it? We, we do community awareness, uh, Youth Champs for Mental Health, um, Empower Pacific, Medical Services Pacific, Life Flying Fiji. All of these people have programs that run. Uh, through the National Committee, we see some of these programs. We also are working with the churches, you know, to use the pulpit to talk about these issues right. that people are facing. Too. Currently, I'm involved with a, with a project through the World Health Organization as a consultant to their, the Health Promoting School Project. We're teaching teachers to look out for suicide warning signs and what uh, they can do to help. How to help is mm. extremely important. And for our primary school teachers, we're teaching them how to talk to our young people, mm. uh, talk to our primary school kids. Obviously, using the word suicide um, uh, uh, with primary school kids is not 
uh, a very effective option. So we talk about everything else like stress and bullying and things yes. that bother you. Yes. And it's okay when things bother you, it's even better when you tell someone else about well, it. Well, it's very hard to imagine what a, a 15 year old, what kind of stress a 15 year old yeah. would go through unless it's school exams. And I know that in Japan, the, high, the rate of suicide mm, among high. school students mm. is like astronomical. Mm. Um, the other issue here in Fiji, of course, is the is the the, the drug situation. The drug you know, situation, I, the bullying, the bullying in our schools is has that increased? Horrid. It's horrid. Uh, statistics that came out in 2018 from the Substance Abuse Advisory Council that sits in the Ministry of Education: uh, 20,000 cases of violence in schools. Uh, A year. Yes, twenty. That was twenty eighteen. Um, twenty thousand cases of bullying. Yeah, approximately. So, what is what do they consider as bullying? Um, oh, the definition of bullying is repeated, targeted, hurtful, and power imbalance. Once you fulfil that, that's bullying. Right. Um, that's in the behaviour management policy of the Ministry of Education. All schools. Um, need to adhere or align to the Ministry of Education policy. So when I talk about the 20,000 in 2018, that's when oh. some sort of physical abuse, uh, physical bullying occurred, relational or social bullying, uh, verbal bullying, and of course, cyber bullying. Cyber bullying is also increasing right, yes, in our country. Yes. Um, so 20,000 cases approximately in 2018. In 2019, 28,000 cases. So it's violence. on the on yeah. increase. But that's not only in schools, that's in the community. No, that's well. schools. That's, that's schools. in schools. That's schools. That's primary and secondary school. A majority of these cases are in our primary schools. In primary in schools? In primary schools. So it's, uh, yeah, it drips our heart out because these are young people who think that lashing out and hitting another kid, swearing, but pinching, Selena, that poking. must come from home. Yes, absolutely. It's got to come from home. And this is, so part of this health promoting school project is training the, the community, talking with our parents on how to be a good parent, you know. Don't just pop the child out into the world and think, ah, that's my job done, because it's just starting. Do you think that's got to do with the fact that there's so many young people affected by this? Do you think it has anything to do with the, uh, you know, the, the digital age that we're going mm -hmm. through. Absolutely. And, you know, we haven't done any research here in Fiji, but the research coming out of Australia, the UK. Um, it's all those games, yeah. isn't it? it? It's this fascination with this thing mm. here. So I'm developing a relationship with my gadget and I don't know how to interact with the person yes. in real life. Right. So we need to teach our children those skills. Uh, we need to teach our children the skills that to be more resilient. For example, I'm watching, uh, I'm watching YouTube, I'm watching Justin Bieber, I don't like Justin Bieber, and I, I just swipe my hand and there's Lisa Bulukoro, awesome. Yes. In real life, I might ask my mother for something and she'll say, wait, wow, wow, Amanda, right. I can't take it, I want the instant gratification. Yeah. Look, there's so much to talk about here and, and it's such an interesting subject. Mm -hmm. Is there a solution? Solution is for people to uh, talk more to each other, uh, be observant, share. You know, um, share your feelings, share your feelings, share your problems. And when people share their problems with you, if you're listening, please don't go and share their problems with someone oh, else. We need to learn to keep uh, other people's stories safe. We also need to uh, remember that's their story. But talking, let's be a community that uh, reaches out and talk to each other. Be a community that cares for young people. When you see people loafing around, stop, tell them what you're doing. Um, when you when people talk out of turn, you you know you turn to them and you say you need to stop and say excuse me, you know just teaching going back right back to the very the basics. basics. I think once we start there, and if there's no uh, mental health condition, then we'll be on the right track. Right. But if we're doing all this wrong here, and then the depression sets in, uh, the stress comes in, uh, the inability to cope, then you know this will just caterpillar into. A, 28,000 numbers of violence in our schools. Oh, this will just go dreadful. into um, an average of 150 suicides in our country every year. Is that the actual? <laughs> it's a bit higher than that. Um, 150 suicides in Fiji? Approximately every year. And on an annual basis, basis. And a population of less than a million people? Uh, yes. 
that is very high statistic. Yeah. We certainly have a problem. Mm. And thank you so much, Selena. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg, mm. isn't it? Yes, yes. And uh, that base really needs to be addressed. Mm. Thank you so much. That is something that we really need to look at. I hope you heard what Selena said. Try and notice the difference in your children's behavior. There are a lot of people who need support, and we can teach them to make a difference. You were watching On Point. Join us back here next Monday night for more stories which inspire, and good night.